Hurricanes Live. This is our edition number 21, but of course, we've done many more of these segments with uh, Cam Underwood from State of the U, but uh, you can lock it in uh, over the past 21 weeks and going forward through the 2019 season each and every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern time for Miami Football Talk. Cam, how you doing tonight, man? I feel good. I feel strong. Uh, glad to be here. Good to, you know, be back. Got my turnover chain shirt on and everything. I don't know if you're listening to this later. Obviously, you can't see it, but if you're with us live, you can see that right there. And yeah, ready to talk a little bit about uh, the Miami Hurricanes. And I don't know. I think that there's a little bit of news <laughs> maybe we can cover or something. I'm not sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> here we go. Uh, so first, I'm going to ask you right out of the gate. Did you expect an announcement forthcoming kind of in this uh timing about 10 days before the the game uh i expected a decision to be made i did not necessarily expect an announcement just because and we're referencing the starting quarterback announcement uh jaron williams retro freshman is going to be the miami hurricane starting quarterback for the opener and then hopefully for the you know duration of the season and i say hopefully hopefully because if he plays well then he will maintain his starting position that is the goal um but yeah, I expected after, and everybody had said after the second scrimmage that they were going to make a decision. Manny Diaz, Dan Enos, uh, just pretty much everybody around expected a decision to be made after the second scrimmage, which was last Saturday. But uh, I was not necessarily expecting an announcement to the public or anything. Um, but yeah, Monday morning, um, they just, uh, Manny Diaz decided that that was it. He had already had a preliminary conversation and uh, whispered over in uh, Jaron Williams's ear that after the scrimmage, he said, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to be the guy. Uh, and then spoke with Dan Enos. Uh, Dan Enos uh, detailed at Media Day yesterday that uh, he and Manny did not speak uh, previously about the quarterback battle because they didn't want to have any kind of uh, influence on what was going on. But when they sat down, they were both kind of waiting for the other one to, to share their ideas. And they were both like, yes, yeah, so Jaron, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. And that was, uh, how that went. So, uh, yeah, Monday morning, 1130 is when the announcement was made. And, uh, yeah. So Jaron Williams is going to be your starting quarterback for the university of Miami. And, uh, you know, very excited, um, to hop into the season, obviously with clarity to that position, um, and just moving forward. So there are two basic dynamics. There's a ton of dynamics, but there's two basic ones that uh, you touched upon to touched upon it to a certain extent in regards to, uh, I think, any coaching staff leading into the season in which there is a heated quarterback battle, especially when it involves inexperienced players in that position, want uh, basically have a framework in which uh, they, they want to be able to announce a decision X number of days, X number of time before the opener. But the competition may not allow that, uh, the, the closeness of the competition. So this seems pretty decided in Jaron Williams' favor. Yeah, very decisive. Um, everybody in all the reports, even from our guys, Gabby Arudia and Marshall Thomas, who have been in practice, Gabby, I think every day, except for like two, um, and Marshall just recently. but uh, And then other people as well, other journalists um, and, and things with their reports as well. But uh, Jaron Williams was the most consistent. Uh, and then he also had a, a measure of explosivity to his play as well. Uh, but his accuracy was there, you know, obviously just um, doing the operational things of getting the, the, the team to the line, you know, executing the motion, uh, audibling when needing to get into a better play, um, just doing all of the things that you need to do. And then again, you know, obviously going up against one of the best defenses in America, the offense is going to struggle a little bit, but Jerry Williams did a good job to handle that, did a good job to bounce back. Uh, it was – Manny Diaz was pissed after the second scrimmage. Um, he was not pleased at all with the offensive performance in the first half of that scrimmage, but uh, did say that the offense bounced back in the second half. And he he noted Jaron Williams for a touchdown pass to Will Mallory in the second half of the last scrimmage. And that was the only quarterback who he mentioned by name, and that was telling. Um, Nikosi Perry, from the highlight video that was put out by the University of Miami Athletic uh, Department, uh, Nikosi Perry did throw a touchdown in the second half as well. But, uh, yeah, apparently, you know, Jaron was just uh, more consistent, and it was pretty decisive. Um you know, Nikosi, uh, he was still turning the ball over a little bit. So even with all the physical gifts uh, that he does possess, if you're giving the ball the, uh, to the other team, that's not a good thing. And then Tate Martell just honestly is not really an accurate passer. Uh, and that bore itself out to be true uh, just over the course of time. 
And Tate Martell even, uh, he was interviewed. It was before the decision was made. It was the second week of practice. But he was made, or all three quarterbacks were made available for a second time of the, of the fall. And he said, yeah, you know, I came in and I was expecting to do all of the offense out of shotgun, which is his strength. You know, if you remember when Brock Berlin was here, uh, excuse me, again, that 2003 game against Florida, we had him all under center and everything. Florida got to that huge lead. We put him, um, you know, four or five wide shotgun and let him chuck the ball and things started to click. So obviously not throwing the ball in the same way as Brock Berlin, but Tate Martell said, yeah, that's the way that uh, I was expecting to go because that fits my skill set more. But Dan Enos uh, being true to himself, he said, look, this is the way I want to run offense. So you got to, you need to learn how to run the offense like this, or you're not, not going to be the quarterback. And, that is uh, what ended up being true. So, uh, yeah, Jaron Williams, like I said before, consistent. Uh, and that word came up routinely, like over and over and over again uh, over the course of time. His consistency, uh, just especially with his accuracy, you know, throwing the ball accurately, not turning it over, uh, and then having a level of explosion uh, to his performance as well. Uh, yeah, it just put him uh, head and shoulders above both Nicosi Perry and Tate Martell, and that's why Jaron Williams is going to be your starting quarterback. Kim Underwood on the line with us from State of the U each and every Wednesday night talking Miami football and much to talk about, of course, concerning one particular position. We will get to the Derek Smith transfer as well, but we'll continue on the quarterback uh, storyline. Of course, Jaron Williams being named the starter this week uh, in reading the statement from Manny Diaz. It seemed very decided. He seemed to be very bold in his statement in regards to talking about determination and skill set and work ethic concerning Jaron Williams. Cam, was the basic reason why Jaron Williams received the least amount of conversation concerning the fan base and others because Tate Martell uh, is coming from a huge program, Ohio State, and before that was a five-star. And of course, Nikosi Perry already played, so there was that that familiarity of what he could do to a certain extent, extent, both the good and the bad, the positive and the negative from last year. So you got a guy that's got some experience that people can relate to versus um, the, the guy that's got the name. He comes from a big program, both in high school and at the other collegiate level program versus the guy that was kind of an unknown to a certain extent, at least in, in when the bullets are fired for real. Yeah, and there was a bit of that, obviously. You know, Nikosi Perry did start five games last year. He threw for over 1,000 yards. Uh, you know, I wrote about it, obviously, in the course of the season, but at one point he had a higher um, – touchdown rate than did Trevor Lawrence in his first couple of starts at Clemson. Uh, you know, he was playing well at the time, and obviously that uh, performance was not consistent. Um, but he was a known quantity. He had started already here. Uh, and then Tate Martell, you know, if you go back to the Netflix show, the QB1, you know, obviously 43-0, um, and 0, three-time national champion at Bishop Gorman High School in Las Vegas, uh, you know, a, a well-known recruit. Um, you know, people say, you know, now, OK, well, he was a five star, but he ended up dropping down a little bit, um, a little, you know, uh, towards the end uh, at the final rankings. Jaron Williams is actually the highest rated player uh, in the final uh recruiting rankings for their given years. Uh, but at a time, Tate Martell was a five-star. Obviously, he had this cachet and everything. He's coming in from Ohio State. Uh, you know, transfer portal was its own story and things like that. Uh, so, you know, just coming down to Miami, uh, ostensibly to start, you know, that's what the expectation, especially for him, had to have been. Um, so, yeah, you're going to look at those guys who are, again, a year older as well, both uh, Martell and Perry being redshirt sophomores versus being a redshirt freshman. Uh, in Jaron Williams. So, yeah, that was it. And, you know, Jaron Williams, uh, honestly, and he uh, it was spoken about at Media Day yesterday uh, with the Miami Hurricanes. You know, he he did not take it well that he didn't start as a true freshman. You know, he was like, look, he, you know, he, he was looking in front of him and saying, look, neither of these guys is as good as me. I need to be out there. I need to be playing. And Mark Rick, you know, wanted to give him the lesson of sitting and learning, you know, from the sideline, getting the mental reps and things like that. And, you know, Jaron Williams put on like 20 pounds. Like he was, he was big and chunky looking like me. And that's not a good thing when you're a division one quarterback right now, you know, I'm trying to lose his weight, but I haven't. And when Jaron Williams closely resembles me physically, that's not a good thing. So yeah, you know, he was, he was very down on uh, just the process on himself and everything. He was very, he was going to call man, um, Mark Rick to transfer and tell him, look, I'm leaving. Uh, Brevin Jordan and somebody else, I forget who, were in the car with him at the time um, that he was going to make that call. Like he had decided it and decided, yo, I'm going to call Mark Rick right now. Brevin Jordan talked him out of that. He decided to stick around. He was working with his high school coach, working with his quarterback uh, trainer up in Atlanta. 
you know, honestly really bought into the strength and conditioning program, reshaped his body, dropped all of that bad weight that he put on just from, you know, eating his feelings and whatnot last year. Yeah, you know, so he he was kind of the not the odd man out, but not necessarily a favorite, not a guy with a storyline. And like if you've been watching these, you know, streams or listening to this podcast, you know that I'm the president of the Nicosi Perry fan club. I've been a fan of Nicosi Perry going on four years now. You know what I mean? Ever since he was a junior in, in high school, the first time that he committed to Miami. Um, but, you know, even when I said that, that I am and I still am a Nicosi Perry fan. And I hope that, you know, somewhere I don't know if it's going to be in Miami, but I hope that he does well. Look, he got beaten out by Jaron Williams. Period, point blank, dot com in the story. So whether I like it, love it, hate it, whatever, same thing with Tate Martell, his sister, apparently, I don't know if that was real or not. Maybe she was popping off on, on social media as well. But regardless of the feelings of anybody else, the thing that I appreciate about the process is Enos and Diaz put all the quarterbacks at the same starting point and said, y'all go run, y'all go win this. And the person who it needs to be, it will be. And, you know, Manny Diaz said it's, it's not going to be a person who wants to be the quarterback. It's going to be the person who cannot live and breathe without being the quarterback at the University of Miami this year. And that was Jaron Williams. And he was hell bent and determined to get that job. And he won it. And like I said, I still am an Akosi Perry fan, but I'm a University of Miami alum and I am. I'm all on a board with Jaron Williams, so I'm going to root him. I'm not. Some people even came in my mentions on Twitter saying, oh, I can't wait for him to throw his first interception in Cam to say, da, 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 da. I don't know who you think that I am. You know what I mean? Like, I want to win. So I hope that that is what comes to fruition. If not, then hopefully he can develop and move forward. But uh, I am not going to sit here and second guess uh, the decision that was made. Obviously, you know, uh, the other guys had their opportunities to win the job, and they did not, but Jaron did. So you know what? We ride with Jaron, and let's go. And, and Cam, you certainly uh, made the point a number of times, and, and certainly uh, we can look at other quarterback situations in recent past uh, across the country to know that this isn't necessarily over a done deal for good. But you did mention off the top the best thing that could possibly happen for Miami football is that Jaron Williams becomes a star, never relinquishes the job, plays extremely well, wins football games, wins a division title, and uh, goes from there. And the other two guys never see the field uh, in meaningful minutes. Uh, but there are three comparable players, especially Perry and Williams. So we've seen this play out in other uh, destinations and other locations and uh, other programs and certainly don't necessarily, <laughs> uh, this isn't necessarily over a done deal in regards to the other players being completely out of the mix because they're so comparable, at least the way they were recruited and ranked at the time. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, it came to light for me. And I re even remember the rankings when I look back at Jaron Williams, once I, I, I saw the news and I saw number five in his class as the pro style passer, number fifth rated, I believe, and number 77 overall, regardless of position. And folks, if you don't follow recruiting, <clears throat> that's rarefied air, number 77, mm -hmm. regardless of position. Uh, that I thought, oh yeah, I remember those numbers. He was that good. This kid just, it just seemed like a, like a shock to a ton of people because right. again, the Tate Martell cash day and then the Perry familiarity from playing and throwing 13 touchdowns last year, they seemed to be the guys everybody was talking about. Right. And the thing about it is, you know, Jaron Williams had almost, what was it? 9,300 yards of total offense and 90 touchdowns in high school, you know, over the course of uh, three seasons, he had like, um, almost 75 or 7,800 yards of total offense in the last two years of him in high school. Like this is a kid who is really damn good. Like he was a U.S. Army All-American and balled out uh, in the same year as Trevor Lawrence, both of them being from Lawrenceville, Georgia, in different high schools, obviously, because you're not going to have two dudes of that caliber playing for the same school. But I mean, yeah, you know, people are like, oh, well, you know, who is this guy? Who is this guy? You know, I even went back and I looked at, you know, all the stuff that we'd previously written about him, you know, the player profile for this year, the recruit notebook that I wrote when he signed um, early, you know, and everything like this is a kid with really elite talent, um, you know, and it, like I said, it, it, it took him a year to get it settled. Uh, it did look like the game was a step too fast for him last year. But, dude, he's been doing his work. He's reshaped his body. He's really leaned in. They have an offense that fits what he does well. Um he does have a good, strong arm. Again, I still maintain that Nikosi Perry has a stronger arm, but don't make that think that Jaron Williams cannot make throws because he can, and he obviously has. So, yeah, this is a guy, a top seven, I mean, almost 75, but 77th overall 
in the recruiting class last year. Yeah, I mean, if you're a top 100, even in the, in the 90s, that's huge. Look at the top 77, 75 guys in any recruiting class. That's not by happenstance. They don't like guys don't just get up there because, you know, of the high school that they went to or anything like that. I mean, that means that you can play. So, yeah, there are lots of things to be excited about with Jaron Williams. As I've said all through this process, all three guys have Miami caliber talent. So even though I might personally be a fan of one more than the other, all three could, if they put things together, be the starting quarterbacks and quarterback, excuse me, at the University of Miami and do well. That happens to be Jaron Williams. He sees the moment he went out and won that job. So, yeah, th this is a guy who might not be known to a lot of people who are not huge recruiting fans, but let it be known and let it be said. Jaron Williams has elite kind of talent that he can display, and hopefully he obviously develops and is able to show that over the course of time wearing orange and green. Cam Underwood joining us from State of the U, of course, each and every Wednesday night here talking Miami football and a very exciting week this week and, of course, next week. I can't believe it's a game week next oh week. That's crazy. I know. I like I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at setting the schedule of you know what we're going to publish over on State of the U, and I'm just like, wow, like next week is game week. That's the yeah, flabbergasting, but hey, you know, we're here. So we'll definitely be owning the moment over on state of the U.com. So be sure that you check us out because we'll have plenty of stuff for you guys over there. And folks, we appreciate the comments and the questions and, and especially those that are uh, um, accompanied by uh, a super chat contribution as uh, Marty Mannings is. Uh, we can get to this in just a second. Or if Cam, if you want to jump in on this, even though it's uh, taking us off the path of the quarterback discussion. He's apparently looking at Robert Burns, uh, mm -hmm. somebody that you've certainly addressed uh, uh, in regards to his health issues, but his enormous ability coming out of high school. Right. And could, th could there possibly be any expectations? Anything that, oh, so the question is, what are the expectations if Burns stays healthy all season this year? Um, anything that Robert Burns gives is, is house money, honestly. Um, you know, hopefully he's able to stay healthy for the first time in five years, uh, five or six football seasons. Like I think the last time he was fully healthy was his freshman, maybe sophomore year of high school. Um, and he's a retro sophomore now. So he's a third year at Miami guy. So that's three. Yeah. So this is like five or six years where he's been injury prone, uh, previously. So we'll see what happens. Um, but he does have great size. He does have the same athletic traits that made him a four-star, borderline five-star caliber player after, again, he put on an absolute show at the regional, uh, Nike Regional uh, down here at American Heritage High School as a high school freshman rising sophomore. If he can – I mean, he still has quick feet. He still has size. He's 5'10", 220 pounds, so he's a big back, but he has some wiggle. Uh, there's been some photos – or videos released from practice of him you know, shaking loose of a tackle and running for 15 or 20 yards. Any of that is just house money. Because Cam Davis and uh, DJ Dallas are going to start. Uh, Lorenzo Lingard, when he gets back healthy, he's going to have to be. I mean, if, if Dallas and Davis, sorry, Harris, excuse me, are one and one A, Lorenzo Lingard needs to be that number two, three, whatever you want to call it after them. And then you sprinkle in a little bit of Robert Burns. So uh, does he have the ability to play here? Yes. Does he have the ability to stay healthy? He has not shown that in any time recently. But if he can, then yeah, I mean, I think that he could have a role on this offense. But again, for me, I'm not expecting anything from Robert Burns just because he's been injured so often for such a long consecutive period of time. But if he's able to stay healthy and he's able to contribute, then that's found money. And I'm, I'm good to go with that. Michael Love, we so much appreciate the contribution right there. Um, uh, Cam and I discussed this before we went on tonight. Uh, we, yeah. we both had some some personal and professional situations and issues this week that didn't really properly prepare us for the Florida versus Miami matchup. Uh, to the to the degree that we would like to discuss it. Sure, right. we could we could get on here and fake it and, and do pretty well in discussing the Gators and the Canes and the matchups and, and, and all those good things. But to do it to our standards, uh, we would like to set up an extra time sometime next week. So, of course, Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern time and then another time throughout the week to set up the Miami defense versus the Florida offense and Gators defense versus the Miami offense with Jaron Williams at the controls. So, Michael, we appreciate uh, the question there but, and appreciate uh, your contribution each and every week. But, uh, well, true. All of that is, is true. So we will dive into like a full just preview episode. Uh, we'll, we'll set up another time next week. But I will address this question from Michael Love. With Florida coming up so quickly, what are the concerns uh, going into the game beyond the offensive line? How much of the playbook do you think that Miami is going to try? Honestly, I just want to see Miami embodying 
the enthusiasm of the new staff. I want them to to perform to the level that, you know, we all greatly aspire. Um, so just just that, you know, just being settled, everybody buying into their roles and then executing. Um, and there, you know, are some people who um, that is a big question mark for um, some of those people like, you know, um, don't aren't going to play. You know, I think uh, it was proven to be true that when Manny Diaz said, you know, some guys on offense got that glazed over look when things went bad in the scrimmage. I mean, I don't know that for certain, but it seems like that was pointing at Nikosi Perry. Nikosi Perry is not going to start. So, you know, Jaron Williams is going to be there. So, uh, you know, there's some other guys in some other positions that, you know, I think are a little bit um, suspect in their past performance. So they're going to need to step it up. Uh, so that's the thing that I'm concerned about. Uh, and then just how the team is going to react when something goes wrong. Uh, you know, it's uh, that that don't quit poem. You know, when things go wrong as they sometimes will, uh, because it will happen. You know, this is not going to be, um, playing NCAA 13 on freshman where you have 900 yards of total offense and 93 points and your opponent has, you know, zero points and negative 500 yards of offense. That's not going to happen. You know, Florida, they do have scholarship players over there. You know, they have over 50%, um, blue chip ratio. So they have some top end talents. You know, you got guys uh, on offense who can make things shake. They got guys on defense who might even have an advantage uh, against who they're going against. So they're going to make plays and Miami is going to have to bounce back. But I want to see what that mental fortitude is like. I want to see how the reaction happens when a negative situation occurs what happens after that? That's what I'm really looking to uh, looking to see and looking to, to to find out about this team because you know you can you can do the mat drills, you can run in the sand, you can run on hills, you can lift, you can yell, you can scream, you can you know do all the things that you want to do on a practice field in an off season situation. But when those lights come on and something goes wrong, how are you going to react? Mike Tyson once said, "Everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth." What happens for Miami when they get hit in the mouth? Because I think that that's going to happen. Florida wants to come out and win this game. Miami wants to come out and win this game. And the same thing for Florida as well. Like, we're going to hit them with a haymaker. Like, do they stumble? Do they get knocked down? Do they get knocked out? But the reaction to things going in a way that they are not necessarily planning on, a coverage breakdown or a missed tackle or a turnover or something like that, how does either team react? That's one of the things that I'm definitely watching next Saturday. Yeah, even at this high level of uh, collegiate football, there are kids that have to see the field each and every year for major, major programs, especially in game one, that aren't necessarily at the preparedness that the coaching staff would like them, but they are just forced into that situation to put very talented kids, but somewhat unprepared that have only seen maybe a few reps in certain situations to see how they're going to prepare and how they're going to be ready and respond to certain situations that uh, maybe they didn't get a ton of reps uh, to, to, to see during practices because of the limited aspect of a collegiate schedule versus we're not talking the NFL with all the preseason games and that being a sole job for each individual. All right. We got Kim Underwood, of course, on the line from state of the U please join him and the rest of the staff over there. It's a first rate staff. Uh, Cam tells us uh, the best they've ever had. So please join them for just the deep dive into Miami football. We give you a ton right here each and every Wednesday night, but for the deep dive to get you ready for the big Florida game that everybody's going to be watching that has any connection to college football. If you're watching college football Saturday, the eyes of the nation will be on Orlando. Damn, we got James Kennedy chiming in, in regards to now I lost track of his question here. Uh, just it's in regards to the style of offense, the approach now that Jaron Williams has been selected uh, and, and what you feel is going to be the lean because of that that um, selection of him at quarterback. I'm excited for the pick of the quarterback because it gives a definition to the position, um, regardless of who the three, which of the three it was going to be. Uh, I appreciate the fact that Manny Diaz and Danny Nose came out definitively and said, this is the guy, this is who we're going with, period. Like it or hate it, get over it, boom. This guy won the job, and he's going out, and he's going to do the job. Um I think that the offense is going to be multiple. You know, uh, we've seen a lot of things. You know, obviously we have two dynamic tight ends in Brevin Jordan and Will Mallory, um, who I don't think any of the linebackers or safeties from Florida can cover. Um, 
And I don't really don't see how that's up for debate. So leaving both of them on the field and moving them around in different scenarios and situations uh, is going to be advantageous. David Hale from ESPN put up a stat yesterday where Brevin Jordan caught 19 out of 22 targets when lined up in the slot last year, easily or the second most efficient tight end lined up in the slot next to um, Isaac Nauta from Georgia uh, last year. So uh, if you move him around into a slot situation, Brevin Jordan has already proven to be an elite playmaker in that kind of a way. So I do expect a lot of two tight end sets um, and it won't necessarily be both in line. You know, they can play H back, fullback motion, move slot, uh, even moving them outside. I mean, Will Mallory, he was a high school wide receiver put on a bunch of weight so he's looking like a prototype tight end uh for the college and professional level so he's going to be out there as well um but obviously you have to run the ball so you're going to try to find ways to do that uh maybe you know some zone blocking maybe some out uh, stretch plays or things like that where you're not necessarily one-on-one -on -one, uh man-to-man -man blocking uh across the board just you know um in that kind of a run game so you you do things to to help out the quarterback maybe a couple screens maybe some slip screens or things like that give them some easy completions dan enos is pretty Previously talked about having a built-in like backside drag or thing, so you have a, a crosser uh, as a check down as well. So it's not just going to go to the running back per se, but it could be uh, you know just a crosser at three yards and you know get those yards and maybe turn it up the field for some yards after catch. So um, James Kennedy says, "I'm thinking a run-heavy spread coast type offense." I just think that that's a lot of words. Um, you know, I think that Miami is going to try to establish the game, uh, the run game. I think that they're going to be multiple. I think we're going to go spread sometimes. I think we're going to go tight sometimes uh, with it. But, yeah, not necessarily uh, going one particular way, but really using the multiplicity of the available talent as the thing that we're going to use to be successful. So whether it's, you know, four wide receivers where there's actual four receivers or you go four wide with two receivers and two tight ends. Uh, yeah, I think that they're going to mix it up a lot. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down Miami. We can only do it uh, and do it to this standard with Cam Underwood from State of the U, who joins us each and every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern time. We appreciate everyone who not only joins the live chat, but for many of you, you encourage others to hit the like button. It means so much. So please help us out with that. Um, we have a question as well, and I'll pop it up on the screen, but it's a question that Cam was going to hit anyway because of the uh, announcement of the transfer of Derek Smith, the safety, uh, who was uh, uh, in the 2017 class coming to the U. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cam, your your thoughts about uh, that announcement? Yeah, that announcement came late in the evening last night. It was like 1145. I was actually going to get ready to go to bed because I had plans today. Um and I saw that like as my last little Twitter check before I went to bed, I saw that. So I ended up staying up a little bit later. Um, it is unfortunate that Derek Smith decided to transfer away from Miami. Um, I think that he was in line for a big role this year. It might not have been as a starter because Gervin Hall and Amari Carter seem to have the starting slots down. Um, but, you know, you're, we're going to have to rotate guys in on defense. You know, like uh, Miami doesn't really have a multitude of game-ready cornerbacks. So maybe you move one of those guys down to nickel, like a Gervin Hall who did that in high school, and then you bring in guys off the bench. Um, so, yeah, you know, being a junior, it's uh, starting to be a money year for him, and he decided that, you know, he want, wanted to start. Um, I put a little bit of conjecture out there uh, or some other people did as well uh, about the fact that maybe he was on the second team, but he was the second safety on the second team uh, behind another player at that position. Um, and that might have irked his ire as well. Um, but yeah, it, it is a blow to the depth of that position. You know, Bubba Bolden did just get to Miami last week. Uh, and I think that he's going to have a big role on defense, but I don't think he's going to have a big role in the opener because he just got here um bubba bolden that is so uh you know with the the starting two safeties of carter and hall now you got robert knowles you got uh bubba bolden and you got keontre smith and keontre smith was even as a true freshman working as on the second team defense with robert knowles so uh yeah bubba bolden i think he will play a big role but and maybe Derek Smith saw it down the line. He said, yeah, maybe I have a, a decent sized role for three or four games. And then Bubba Bolden is going to take my snaps. And then you got this freshman All-American kid or this high school All-American and Keontre Smith. And he's going to come in and he's going to yada, 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 sis, boom, ba. So, I mean, it is tough to lose a guy of 
uh, Smith's caliber. And apparently he was taking massive, massive steps forward this offseason. Uh, like pretty much every practice they were talking about him making plays. And I mean, there was even uh, videos from different practices of him just uh, absolutely, you know, lambasting somebody and causing a fumble here and, you know, picking off a pass there. But, uh, you know, I just honestly think it's to the point where he wanted to start and not be a role player, even if he was going to play a big role uh, on this team and be assert, uh, assured of that role, especially with, you know, a guy of Bubba Bolden's caliber who was going to start at USC as a true sophomore before he had his, uh, you know, incident where he, you know, was kicked out of the university and everything. So, uh, yeah, it is tough to lose a player of Derek uh, Smith's caliber, but uh you know, onwards, upwards, and forwards. There's other talented guys in that safety room, and they're all going to have to step up. So my apologies to whomever uh, contributed a couple bucks. We appreciate uh, that. Uh, that's ax asked specifically about the Derek Smith situation, as many of you did. But I like to acknowledge those by getting those on the screen. Please understand that the, um, the software application that I'm using is behind yours, so I cannot go back as far on the live chat and pull those comments. I can only go maybe 20, 25 uh, back. So they sometimes get lost and I can't retrieve them, but we appreciate uh, that contribution. Big Dave Nick, 70, uh, chiming in with the Don Chaney Jr. And and Cam, I, I follow all college football and don't focus just on Miami, but man, I saw so many comments about this. And I think a number of people on Twitter tagged me and then they were just on a rampage about it in regards to what we've discussed in the past and that you've eloquently addressed in regards to the politics involving the recruiting rankings. Yeah. So Don Chaney Jr. lost his fifth star from his ranking uh, in the latest updates uh, for 247 Sports uh, proprietary rankings for the composite rankings. Uh, also on Rivals.com. I don't think he ever was a five star. Uh, and then you, you know, obviously you put all that together and then he drops down. Um, I think it's ridiculous. I think that Don Chaney is the best running back prospect in the state of Florida, bar none. That's including five-star Clemson commit uh, DeMarcus Bowman from Lakeland. Um, he has just the the total package. Um, and whether he's a four-star or a five-star, that kid's going to come in and he's going to take snaps as a freshman. I, I don't care. So, um, yeah, it is infuriating um, just because – at every event, Don Chaney still stands out for his um, high-level play uh, and everything. He has a prototypical build at 5'11", approaching 200 pounds at a running back. I mean, I know he's not a 4'3 guy on the laser time, but he's always running away from guys on the field. His balance, his vision, coordination, strength are all just elite. And that, I mean, that's just a, a point of fact. So, yeah, to see that again, and I've spoken about this on here uh, and on the website uh, many times, but just to see Don Chaney Jr. Uh, stripped of his five-star uh, ranking is, uh, especially with, with no games going on. So it's not even like he went up against a good high school defense and then uh, wasn't able to perform. Uh, when I worked at Miramar, they played uh, South Plantation with Alex Collins, uh, both his junior and senior years. Uh, the senior year uh, for Alex Collins, that was a district game and a playoff game. Um, and in the playoff game, I think that Alex Collins had five yards ish. I want to say, uh, but he was like a five star because of his build and da, 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 you know, and everything. And that's going up against one of the best high school defenses that's you know ever walked around in, in South Florida. Um, but he was able to maintain that. Uh, but in the case of, and then he ended up going elsewhere. Uh, so that was after he had decommitted from Miami. But Don Chaney being committed to Miami, obviously, that's the reason that uh, I believe uh, these ranking sides decided to drop his his ranking and everything. Uh, and I stand by that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't agree with it at all. I think that he's a playmaker. He is spoken of as one of the best players that a lot of evaluators and coaches and recruiting analysts have ever seen. Um, but all of a sudden, now nah, he's not a five-star, which – I think it's asinine, but whatever. I would love to have him in orange and green, whether he's a one-star or a five-star, because that guy's going to come on the field and make plays. Sure. Since once uh, they hit the field, uh, the star rankings go away, and they all got to compete on the field. And if they're up to it, then uh, regardless of what the ranking is, hey, they're going to shine on the field against the competition. <clears throat> this is Miami Hurricanes Live. It comes your way each and every Wednesday night. It took me forever to brainstorm to come up with that name, Miami Hurricanes Live. Yeah, it, it was a, a very uh, creative uh, move on my part. 
But uh, the the main thing is that we're here every Wednesday night at eight o'clock, and we've got Cam Underwood on the line almost each and every time to deliver the best in Miami football analysis. Want to remind you that I'm here each and every day talking college football. So please lock it in if you uh, enjoy the other programs and the other conferences and teams, and want to get a complete perspective on college football with the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry. Want to point you down to the description section below if you'd like to put a couple bucks on the games. Grab the link that is next to the hashtag Sam Strong. Hashtag Sam Strong. It goes to a worthy cause that we've outlined elsewhere. It's a joint venture between a number of YouTubers. I'm honored to be asked by a volunteer roadshow, St. Jude's Hospital, and betnow.eu to take part in this. But you've got to use the promo code MRTVCFB. It's down in the description section below, MRTVCFB. And you get an additional 50% added to your account if you sign up using that promo code. So if you're a little bit math challenged, that would mean if you throw in a hundred bucks, you get 50 more for free to uh, put on the games. Cam, let's see what we got here next. Uh, so this is more of a factor at the professional lever, level where the politics, maybe the money that certain players are making mm -hmm. uh, creep into the decisions made, determining who gets a starting spot, who gets playing time, uh, do you think that there was anything involved in regards to what's being discussed here by 863Kane uh, concerning the uh, respect that he's giving Manny Diaz in, in in making what he believes to be the right choice based on just sheer playing ability? Yeah, and I mean, in, in past years with uh, quarterback battles, there's you know obviously been rumors that there were extraneous factors that he factored into what the decision was. <clears throat> Manny Diaz said, look, I'm I'm about this I'm about that life I'm about this business so the best player is going to play uh, and I I agree with a six three Kane respect to Manny for doing that I mean it would be easy to you know lean on and Kosi Perry be like oh it's a safe choice he was here he's already started you know obviously the kind of media groundswell that's surrounded Tate Martell since I mean he committed to Washington when he was a rising ninth grader as an in, in middle school Tate Martell so he's been in the the conversation of college football for a long time to this point so obviously you know the transfer portal thing him getting immediate eligibility excuse me um for this season was a big thing and people were thinking oh well you know yada 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 for whatever reason uh, Manny Diaz is going to be pressured or the poli the game of politics is going to force him to play uh, a player other than, for reasons other than the, their aptitude and performance on the field. Uh, that's not the case. I, I, I applaud him greatly uh, for sticking to his guns and really, you know, doing what he believed to be the right choice. So, yeah, I mean, have there been, uh, excuse me, um, has politics been a, a factor in quarterback decisions previously at the University of Miami? Absolutely. Has it was it a factor in this one? I don't think so. Um, obviously, you know, we'll have to see. But I really honestly believe that Jerry Williams went out there was the most consistent and best option. And that's why he won the job. So just like uh, a 63 Kane says, yeah, salute to Manny for not playing politics and going with the best player. Kim Underwood, State of the U, supplying the best in Miami football analysis with us each and every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern time. And as we mentioned just a few minutes ago, next week is game week. And so we would like to provide you, as we've talked about, uh, uh, matchup uh, analysis of the Florida offense against the Miami defense and the Canes defense against the Florida offense, both ways, both sides of the football. We're here every Wednesday night, so we will be back uh, at this time next week, and we're trying to figure out a time to bring you another live stream with uh, over 400 on the line right now. So we appreciate wow. you jumping on board as we get close to the season. I think the numbers will jump. It looks like it tonight with uh, the big quarterback decision and people. Cam wanting to know, what does Cam have to say about the quarterback decision? So here they are. And, uh, of course, we've got a game week coming up next week, so we appreciate not just you jumping on board, your contributions in so many ways, the likes, the the, the super chat, and otherwise, but also uh, let people know that we're here each and every Wednesday night and bring more along with you. Um, let's see, where are we? What else did we have? Uh, I, I saw somewhere in the chat a reference to the over-under for the game and the Vegas line, which is, I think, right around a touchdown to seven and a half. Cam, what do you think are the main factors that have determined that uh, point spread? Um, the lack of knowledge of what Miami's offense is going to be. 
uh, I think. And then also, you know, Florida coming off of, very, off of a very strong season. Excuse me for stumbling over my words. Uh, as I look on VegasInsider.com right now, uh, the line is my, oh, excuse me, Florida by a touchdown. The over unders that I'm seeing are 47 and a half. Um, so that's like a 28 to 21 or 28 to 20, 27, 20, somewhere in there kind of a game they're, they're looking at. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's fair based upon where each program was the last time that we saw them, you know, not in the spring, but in, in last, you know, in January or December. Uh, Miami obviously had an underwhelming performance in uh, what ended up being Mark Rick's final game uh, in the, what was that, Pinstripe Bowl or whatever the bowl, that terrible bowl game was that we lost to Wisconsin by a million points. Uh, and then Florida won their bowl game uh, against Michigan, even though Michigan didn't have all of their guys on defense or anything. They still went out there and won that game. So based upon that, heading into this season, it makes sense that um, that Florida would be favored. In that game, obviously, a, a 47 and a half over under is relatively low. So you don't think it's going to be a huge kind of shootout. Um, you know, Clemson, Georgia Tech, they, there's a 60 point over under in that game. Um, FIU Tulane, 57 point over under. So like, you know, being at, at 47 and a half is uh, substantially lower uh, than some other teams or other games uh, opening lines, it looks like. So, yeah, you know, it's a it's an interesting kind of a thing. Uh, I think that it's fair. Obviously, uh, you know, I would like to go on the Miami side of things with uh, my betting money if I were to to wager any, but I don't think that it's crazy heading in based upon where each program ended last year and taking the offseason into account with several things that you would put uh, Florida as a touchdown favorite uh, at this point on, you know, any odds making service, but I don't in either way, I don't think it's going to be a blowout uh, e going either direction uh, with the defensive focus game because I think the defenses on both sides are ahead of each offense as well. So I think that it's really um, – I think that's fair. And, I, you know, obviously we'll see if it gets – I thought I saw that the line got down to six and a half uh, for the game this week. I was talking uh, with Rob Cassidy from Rivals about it on, on Twitter. He's thinking it might even get down to six before kickoff. Uh, I hope not. But we'll see. <laughs> We'll I see. wanted those points. Well, and, then you should have got on it early when, I when really it opened and Florida early. was, uh, what, 10 and a half, 11 point favorite yeah. uh, when it opened. Like, if you wanted those points, like, there was a time when you could have had three, four and a half more points than it currently stands. Because there's not anything close to a touchdown difference in talent between the two teams. It's basically right. what Cam outlined. Vegas likes knowing. They like known commodities, and mm -hmm. there are less known commodities or more known commodities, coach, quarterback on the Florida side. And they like that uh, because they, they've got numbers to back up and they've got a track record and resume. But if you're just looking at rosters, it's a toss up. Right. Uh, NCI is fanatic. 21 is asking me if I'm going to the game. I have a plane ticket to Orlando on a Friday night, the 23rd. Yes, I'm going to the game. I, I have not, uh, I have, I'm not necessarily going to the game. I am going to the area and going to be watching the game and covering it um, to, to make a bit of a splash for the channel. So I thought this was a good time to do it, considering that this is a big game, number one. Number two, it's isolated by itself in week zero. And uh, somebody reminded me today that I don't have a hotel room. So I might be walking the streets uh, homeless uh, the night before the game. I, I got to work on that tonight. Look, there are uh, I got Kim Underwood on the line from State of the U. What's yeah, that? I was going to say, there's plenty of hotel rooms in the Orlando area. Like they kind of specialize in that. So <laughs> you'll be able to find one. Trust me. Yeah, they do have a few down there. And yeah, if all, if, if, if uh, push comes to shove, I've got a deal with Disney that I could actually kind of stay oh, over yeah. there. Uh, that I've got that connection there that, uh, that can be had for a, very much reduced rate. Yes. I can't find the comment in the chat on the screen to put it on the actual uh, screen here, but I see it on my phone here from Scott Key. Great show, Mark and Cam, 23-year-old Canes fan here with an off-subject fun question. Boy, well, let's go. maybe I should have read it before I got to this deep, but Scott is making a contribution. Let's go. Cam, who do you think is the greatest hurricane in the last decade? That's a great question. That's something that we're going to talk about the offseason when we're fi uh, finished with the 10 years of 
uh, you know, football in this decade. So between uh, 2010 and 2019. So um, personally, if I were to say one player in this decade, it's hard to go against Duke Johnson. I mean, he's an all-time career-leading rusher. Uh, you know, he played uh, for three years here before going to the NFL. Uh, and there's a lot of other good guys. You know, I'm and I'm not spiting anybody by highlighting him, but off the top of my head, and I do, I love that question. Uh, I would have to go with Duke Johnson, but I guarantee you, we will have. Um, something along the lines of the canes of this decade after this season on state of the U.com for a hundred percent. Okay. I cannot answer this question. Maybe cam can, even though it's a Florida oriented question, I posted here because poor Travis Overstreet is, is, has asked this question, I think four times. So he okay. really wants a decision on this. Travis, I would point you toward Gators breakdown or a Florida podcast, unless cam, for some reason knows he's asking about the right tackle, position between Gene DeLance and Kyrie Campbell injured. Who's going to start uh, starting right tackle for the Gators. Gene DeLance is on crutches starting defensive tackle. Kyrie Campbell is injured. Yeah, no, I don't know. Honestly, um, I was focused on a couple other things that have been going on in my personal and professional life um, where, and you know, honestly, I don't follow these other teams. Like, it's about this orange and green. You know what I mean? Like, I'm all about this you. Um, that's it. You know, I'm really focused on what we're doing. Obviously, you know, with the quarterback battle going on and all kinds of things like that. Um, and so game week is when I really look at uh, where these other programs stand from an injury standpoint and things like that. So, uh, Travis, I appreciate the question. That's honestly just outside of my knowledge base because I've been focused entirely and exclusively on the Miami Hurricanes football team. Uh, we're going to have to find out about that later. Or, you know, if you know anybody, um, you know, Harrison Tenzer on, uh, on Twitter, he's a Gators fan. He talks, well, I mean, he's a Canes fan because he talks about Miami more than he does UF. But, uh, you know, our SB Nation blog, Alligator Army, maybe that's a place to go for it, uh, that information as well. But, yeah, that's not a thing that I'm really apprised of because, uh, like I said, I focus on the University of Miami. Hey, guys, uh, again, I simply hate when I don't catch up with a contribution that's tacked onto a question or a comment. And, and, and again, please understand that I can only have um, – availability of the like the last 20 to 25 comments to get those on the screen because they go away. I know that you can still see them on YouTube all the way, maybe to the beginning of the show, but I can only grab the last 20 to 25. So if you make a contribution, I miss it. I am so sorry. Uh, I will shoot a video. I marked it down right here. It says shout outs. And I did this about two weeks ago. I really need to do some shout out videos for those of you, not that just make the contributions, but uh, like the videos and are here on a regular basis and have subscribed recently. And um, you old timers as well will we'll, we'll shout out and, and I'll get that done very soon. I also have just uh, put together some information about my prediction record over the last 10 years that I'm going to shoot a video, let you know what the prediction record has been against the spread and straight up uh, because we're going to make that available uh, elsewhere. Nice. All right. We're sitting at 8.53. We've got a few more minutes, Cam. What's what's on your mind? Um, question on the screen. Uh, Gators offensive line is somewhat green because they lose several players. Miami defense will harass Felipe Franks um, during the game. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I think that both defenses are ahead of the offenses uh, that they're going up against. And I mean, I know that Felipe Franks had a decent statistical season last year, but he does not instill the, you know, fear of anything in me. Um, so, I mean, obviously the defense needs to play well to force him into some tough situations. So we'll see. And obviously, you know, you know, the offensive line on both sides is going to be key to success. Whichever offensive line plays well or better, you know, is able to run the ball, control the clock, things like that, uh, you know, and create space for their, you know, elite playmakers to make plays is going to be successful. So, you know, I mean, uh, if Miami's defensive line and front seven is able to uh, harass the Florida defense or Florida offense, excuse me, and uh, put them behind the sticks and get them off the field, I would be fully in favor of that kind of a thing. So I hope that uh, I hope that you're right about that. Cam, uh, Cheryl is an Ohio State fan. I know Bro. you can appreciate that. Bro. But but she joins us for just like pretty much every live stream, including the Miami live stream. She's here 
each and every week to 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 support us, support me, support us. Mm -hmm. So even the Buckeyes fan is on the live chat, and and I just enjoy this. I have no idea what's it in. It applies to what's it referencing. It just says Mark knows. Cheryl, thank you. We'll just say that applies to just anything college football related on this channel. Just Mark knows. I have no idea why you wrote that, but uh, we appreciate it. I mean, hey, just getting that that validation and support has to feel good. So, yeah. So, again, it's every Wednesday night here with Cam Underwood from State of the U. And uh, considering how entertaining and informative and insightful these shows have been for the last 21 weeks, keep in mind that we're talking about a lot of what's happened in the past, uh, projections for the future. In two weeks, we are going to have football to talk about. And then we're going to have uh, the combination of the football that was just played to talk about and the football coming up the next Saturday to talk about. We are going to be jam-packed with uh, topics and storylines uh, for Cam and I and all of you to discuss. So it's going to be a really good time coming up. It already has been. But again, when there's actual football to talk about on the field, then it really ramps up in terms of the fun and uh, the insight and information and analysis. Cam and I are going to figure out another time, hopefully, considering my work schedule, this could be difficult, but we'll figure something out Ditto. next week to give you a breakdown of the Florida offense and defense versus the Miami offense and defense uh, for a couple live streams next week. Cam, anything we've missed? Anything on the recruiting front? Um, nothing really new um, on the recruiting front. I did just publish this month's class breakdown uh, finally. I know that I took a bunch of time off between installments this summer. I took two months off before the one in June and then almost two months between the one in August. But, uh, you know, Miami is in a good spot um, right now. Not a great spot, but obviously needs to close. Uh, I think I talked about this on here a couple of weeks ago where pretty much every uh, tent pole of the rules of the recruiting rules that I wrote uh, previously needs, uh, I would give that maybe a B or a B plus. So good, but not great um, for the class so far. But yeah, you know, that's a, uh, that's where, where things stand. So, you know, recruiting is in a decent spot, but a little bit of a holding pattern seeing uh, pending what happens on the field. So, uh, yeah. I attempt to pre-record enough material so that you don't miss me too much, but I've been gone for five or six days. And then actually the previous weekend I was gone for five or six days. Uh, so two trips that almost, uh, encapsulated the week, but uh, we try to get as much content produced that we can uh, release those throughout the week and you don't miss us too much, but I am back and ready to go full throttle college football. And of course, I consider the opener, excuse me, Miami and Florida fans, I consider the opener the next week. This is really putting a kink in my offseason preparation because it cuts down a week of previews and predictions and all the stuff that I like to do because basically for the predictions to be valid, I need to get those in by Mm, next Friday at the latest. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, it moves everything up. I, I mean, I was used to having a couple more weeks before the first game week, but especially, uh, you know, moving it up to the 24th um, and it being Miami versus Florida. So we're going to have this massive, you know, content push on state of the uh, that we always do when we have a rivalry game. So uh, I'm in the same boat as you, brother. So, yeah, we're just going to have to fight through it, I guess. So we pushed it to about 4.30 on the line. At one point, we appreciate you stopping by. If you missed any of the content, this is going to process and post. And of course, you can catch the entire segment that pushed about 55 minutes here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And the cut down versions are over on the Miami channel, Mark Rogers TV, Miami, where you can uh, get the bite-sized segments of five to 10 minutes of Cam's analysis on the various topics that we addressed, of course, tonight we will announce when we'll be back next week but you can count on wednesday night at eight o'clock eastern time and another segment coming up breaking down the big game between florida and miami cam we always appreciate it uh it can't be stated enough there's no way we could do this in any way shape or form anything close to what we do with you on board otherwise yeah, like I said, I always have a good time here and appreciate uh, you know you uh, inviting me here and being with everybody. Um, the last thing that I'll say is always follow us across all of our channels. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Underwood Sports. Our website's Twitter, which is managed by myself and uh, Deputy Managing Editor Marshall Thomas, is at The State of the U on Twitter. Facebook.com slash The State of the U and the uh, sorry Instagram.com slash The State of the U and 
um, the website is stateoftheu.com. So uh, you see it on the screen right there. If you're listening to the sound of my voice, the dulcet tones, uh, as it were, on a podcast, that's exactly where you can find us. So we're always grinding, always pushing, uh, have practice reports pretty much every day. We have player profiles, position previews, game previews. Um, I'm working on this year's roundtable for season predictions. Uh, and then you know, there's a lot of that. And then obviously for Florida week, we're going to have a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of content as well. So we're always, you know, pushing things through for the Canes uh, in, in a content uh, perspective over on stateoftheu.com and all these different kind of social channels. So please come on over uh, and fan with us and let your voices be heard. Miami fans, give that Michigan State preview a whirl, a whirl just for the heck of it. I think that's my last released video a few hours ago. Michigan State football. I don't know. Just a random comment there. But uh, we'll talk Miami here again next Wednesday night and another uh, show to be announced. Cam, we appreciate it. You have a great rest of your week and weekend. Mark, you do the same. And the last thing that I will say before getting out of here, I'm going to have a great, great weekend. Why? Because it's my birthday on Saturday. Happy birthday. Appreciate it. I'll see Here you Here we ask. 38. 38. 38. Yeah, so the 38th annual celebration commemorating the most awesome day in the history of the world. So uh, very excited about that. Going to hang out with some friends and everything. So, so what else happened on your birth date? Who cares? I was born. <laughs> Boom. I mean, that's the, the number one end of list. Like everything else is uh, secondary to that. So, yeah, going to have a good time this birthday. So uh, if you're listening to then, then, you know, appreciate you guys. And uh, we'll see you next week after I've uh, completed another trip around the sun. Happy birthday, Cam. We will see everybody else next week and sooner. Uh, of course, we're here each and every day. See you.